yeah, we're going to have to have a talk with the uh, with the guy that's holding these things. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm kind of surprised that Marco makes it online as much as he does. I am too. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure I'd be cut out for that. It's a lot of work, I'm sure. Well, Greetings. Hi, John. How you doing? Hey there. Good. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good afternoon to you because we're probably in the same time zone, John and I. <laughs> can you hear me, guys? Oh, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. TJ? Uh, oh. That's TJ, yeah. Awesome. I, can, I can hear you, Ed. Okay, good. Okay. How cool is that? Mm hmm. Yeah, well, you can even hear Mark. Gee, look who's here. Good. Sorry, I'm late. They're fashionably, busting, fashionably late. You're, they're busting your balls for being a minute and a half late. <laughs> well, I have good reason. I went out for a walk, and we have uh, in, in around the neighborhood and in different parts of the city, they have these things called little free libraries where people. Uh -huh. You know, can put out books they want to give away or pick yeah. up books. Anyway, I always ha I look into those, and I got four books. Cool. One is called the, the Death of Money. Uh huh. The other is I know that one real well. <laughs> <laughs> Old Testament parallels. So this is looking at the uh, mythologies uh, from the same time as when the Bible was written. This one's uh, history of the English language in the U.S. That might be interesting. It is a good book. I like oh, you that. Know it. Oh, oh yeah. Cool. Oh yeah. And here's the here's kind of like the the bonus, unplug from the matrix. <laughs> yeah, okay. the truth is sometimes stranger than fiction. Matrix. The truth is always stranger than fiction. All right. Well, we're here. Yes, we are. And there. And yonder. Yonder. Um. Well, everyone here has introduced themselves before uh, in, in the video <laughs> setting, but um, TJ, this is your first time on a call. Uh, you want to just say hi? And Oh, I can't hear you. You want to try now? My end or yours? There you go. Am I on? So yeah, you're on. You're a, bit, you're a bit low. Your volume yeah. is a bit low. Can you want to check out where you have your microphone placed? Testing one, two. Testing. Technology, love it. Is that a little better? A little, maybe you can just shout. <laughs> <laughs> Right. The missus and the kids already think I'm crazy, so. <laughs> yeah. Don't disappoint them, DJ. <laughs> All right, well. Uh, of course, I, if it'll try to figure this out. So what you can do is you could look uh, in Zoom. If you have the Zoom application, you can go to the preferences. And then when you're in the preferences, go to the audio tab. And there will be a setting there for your microphone, which lets you choose which microphone you're using. It's possible that you, your microphone is set to, I don't know, uh, or the setting is low. Now we don't hear you at all. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let me try to play around with this. Okay. All right. But, you know, um, what you're, you know, we can hear your voices. It's cool. And on the um, post processing end, I can run it through a program that will level out our voices a little bit. It won't be, you know, perfect, but it'll be good enough. We'll just be really quiet when you talk. We'll listen very closely. So um, I asked Michael if he'd kick us off today and kind of just set the stage for the, the conversation. And um, But actually, before we start, 
Can we all just do a quick mic test just to make sure that we're all audible? Hello, hell. This this is our umbilical cord, after all. Can you can you hear me? <laughs> I hear I can, you. You're good. Okay. Can Loud. you hear me? Indeed. Okay. Hello. Hello. I'm get, I'm gonna yep. be muted most of the time. Hmm. You'll be our our silent witness. Yeah, but what, I'm kind of in a busy place, so I'll be quiet most of the time until I need to jump in. You can be our placenta. Hmm. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Marco's really into this, I can tell. <laughs> I'm not sure, sure about this negative gynecology thing. I'm really not sure about this. <laughs> He's no. the only female, once again, the only female in this forum. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad we're not without, believe me. <laughs> Love you, Ed. <laughs> all right, take it away, Michael. It's all you. So I, I, Marco asked me to speak. I responded a few minutes ago, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, I mean, we all read this, and the, the topic is focusing on um, the placenta as something related to but distinct from the exchange with mother. That's how I understood this. And... Um, and later metaphors of the tree. So um, what struck me is uh, his trying to find a language for what was prelinguistic and settling on a preposition with. Okay. And uh, this, this relates to work I know by a brilliant integral theorist, very grounded, named Bruce Alderman who has a whole theory of prepositions and um, actually different parts of language and how they open up certain senses of the world. So it really resonated as opening up what might be called the causal space, this width. Um, the width being something pre-objective, pre-subjective. I thought that was very interesting. Um, my overall sense is that Slaughter Dyke is giving great weight to the material biological processes in the womb and birthing, and then reading large swaths of culture as echoing those processes, and he's layering this. And at times, he seems to me to be seeing these later developmental aspects of separate adult life as a longing for, not just a memory of, a longing for this. And sometimes it sounds a little Freudian despite his anti-Freudianism, that these symbolic um, aspects are also substitutes of a kind for this loss of um, these primal processes. At one point, language is thought of as a substitute for the blood exchange with the mother through the umbilical cord. And that modernity has discarded the placenta as essential, and he sees this as, as another symptom of this isolated autonomous subject that he really thinks is somehow ontologically not correct. Um, what I'd say is that, um, for myself, is that I'm reminded of Ken Wilber's distinction of the pre-trans fallacy of um, early developmental and later developmental features, and that certain theorists um, he calls reductionists, in which they tend to reduce later development, which Wilber would say are actual true emergences in the cosmos. Human being. They're really non reducible emergencies, and there's a tendency to see those as somehow always being pulled backwards into this orbit. And uh, I wouldn't want to characterize Slatterdyke in those terms, but for me, it raises the question of what degree Slatterdyke is allowing for adult emergencies to be of their own kind and what degree he's seeing them as being always already pulled back magnetically back into this early experience of separation of some kind. So that would be my general feel for it. I don't know if it's really correct or not, but that would be my general feel. And that 
where one stands on Slaughter Dyke has a lot to do with what degree one sees these early processes as significant and what degree one sees one can grow out of them or not. That's what I'd say. I hope that's useful. Well, if I, if I, as the curb engine of the group can uh, jump in there, I'd like to thank you, Michael, very much for a very clear statement that, uh, cause I, th I think, I think, um, that res what you said resonates well with what I thought I was reading. And I'm not always sure what I'm reading. That's been my problem up until now. So what, this, this was very good for me to find some confirmation that maybe I'm not completely missing the point. And, and I, thought, I thought it was a very clear and lucid um, description of what was going on there. I, I appreciate that greatly. That's why I said I like it being in the group here because you guys keep me straight. I, can I chime in? Um, uh, you mentioned Michael. Thank you, Michael. That was great. Uh, about Schlotterdijk as reading culture, as echoing this um, this sort of trauma of uh, the separation between mother and child and the unintegrated nature of that. There are many echoes of that in our popular culture and high culture. Um, we're just full of this kind of uh, nostalgia. Um, and I'm also... And you mentioned the, the pre-trans, possible pre-trans fallacy that's being committed, the, um, the elevation of the pre-linguistic or pre-personal to transpersonal or translinguistic. That would be in one direction, but you could also reduce something that was transpersonal to the uh, pre-personal. And you, you think that Schlotterdijk might be uh, committing that error. I'd that say error. that it's an interesting question, right, to, to, to play with these directions with him, yes. Yeah. I think that's very important distinction that you're making. And I'm drawing upon uh, previous comments that you've made about Michael Washburn. And I recently reread his dynamic, The Ego. His first book, yeah. Yeah. And um, I'd read it about 20 years when I was in the middle of all these uh, Wilbur, Wilbur controversies with him. Right. And it was interesting for me to go back and reread it because a lot's happened in those 20 years and I can resonate much more deeply with the text than I could. Um, but he says something I think very useful for this discussion. He talk, Michael Washburn talks about the reintegration uh, phase that can occur um, once we go through the alienation existential crisis of the separation, we can, we can enjoy this reintegration. And he speaks about one sign of this is the awakening as the transition to integration is made, the ego becomes aware of itself as having two bodies, not only the physical body, which is now awakened, but also an energic or spiritual body, the circulatory power of the, of the dynamic ground. And I think that's very significant. And I, do th I have not found Schlotterdijk um, I think he's aware of this, but I think you may be right. His anti-modernism is so extreme that I think he's he's failing to, uh, or maybe his uh, his uh, sort of uh, his his Germanic kind of fascination with Freud and all that, and all that depth psychology, which is which I think explores the alienation and the the disruption quite a bit. But I don't think we get to the this integral phase. This uh, the awakening of the etheric body that uh, Washburn, I think, uh, focuses his attention on. So I think that has a lot to do with uh, this this whole uh, metaphor of the um, the amnia. What do you call it? the placenta? Uh, sort of a uh, that gets discarded and, and, and is buried in somebody's backyard. <laughs> you know? And um, I think that. There is, and he's talking about playmates, you know, uh, imaginary playmates, and we need them as adults as well. Every time we go to sleep, there's still a, a, a sort of a, a need to imagine somebody's going to hold down, um, keep all of this going. Um, and then we wake up in the morning and go, we go back to our regular self, assuming that something was taken care of during the night. Um, and if we have direct contact with those uh with the etheric, etheric body, I think at night is when the etheric body really takes charge. 
And we can develop a very intimate relationship with that etheric body if we're attuned to it. Um, so I'm just offering that as uh, some of the big question marks I have about where this text um, may be going. Uh, I read a little bit in the next chapter and he talks more about the double. And uh, I think this, but he seems to be characterizing it as sort of like a, a wishful thinking or a fantasy. And I actually believe that for people who've gone through this, what I think Wilbur would call the centauric phase, this integration of body and mind, it's not a fantasy at all, but definitely a living, uh, breathing, every moment awareness of this dynamic ground, which is uh, holding everything together. And the ego then becomes a servant of that rather than some tormented, alienated, uh, you know, lost in space kind of uh, pathos. So anyway, that's my, my two cents. I hope that made sense. Yeah. Thank you. There. Um, Sloterdijk is writing in a different, he's part of a different conversation, I think, than I, Michael Washburn, perhaps, or any other thinkers who would be, or writers, let's say, who would be dealing with the etheric body, uh, uh, trans-rational experience, uh, non-rational experience, let's say, sometimes trans, sometimes tr pre. So he's in a different he's discourse. He's, he's addressing different readers. Uh, I think that's something to keep in mind. Some things that um, would be obvious or taken for granted uh, by um, communities that are more steeped in uh, the consciousness culture, uh, new age, psychedelics, etc., cetera, uh, are not really kind of part of, they're not really currency, I think, in continental philosophy, that, that particular lineage or more than, more than a lineage, that tradition, let's say, of, of, um, of thought and that, that genre as well. So there's a kind of a genre blurring here a little bit. And in the beginning of this chapter, he talks a bit, he, he talks a bit about really what he's asking is how can we get to a articulation? How can we get, how can we say something that's unsayable? Uh, and that something is these sort of pre-linguistic experiences that in his view or in the theory, I think that he's laying out his spherology are formative. Uh, something about them, something about their shape, their feel, something about the perceptual characteristics of those experiences kind of carries on. It doesn't, I, in my reading, at least, doesn't determine those later emergences, uh, but it's, e, it's inextricable, you know, from, from them. And I think that w the kind of deeper, the kind of meta question that he's asking, to put it in the crudest terms, is why are we so fucked up? Like, what about us is so crazy that we're in, we've engaged in this large-scale process of destroying our world, destroying our, you know, our spheres. And I think that what he's doing by going back to the womb, the placenta, the heart, all of these prime, primary uh, types of experiences is, I think he's getting to, he's trying to get to like where, he's trying to trace back, if you will, to where those disjunctures, where those, those um, the fragmentation uh, kind of arose out of. Uh, and perhaps through doing so to disentangle, I, I don't know. I mean, this, I mean, I, 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 there's something therapeutic about it. There's something, um, uh, there's something of a kind of just, you know, exploratory curiosity even p potentially about, about, about it. He writes at one point about this, the, the pharaohs who might spend millennia contemplating like the question of what is the knob, the original knob object, like what is that causal space? Uh, and I actually think that there's something very, to address Ed's curmudgeon, uh, curmudgeon perspective, I think there's something very hipster friendly in, in what he's doing, uh, insofar as without reference to the structural kind of unfolding of structures of consciousness from you know, magic, mythic, mental, etc. He's actually taking us back into the origins of our experience of magic phenomena, or what we can interpret to be magic phenomena now. Um, the, you know, the tone of voice, uh, eye contact, vision, feeling, um, these sort of pre-linguistic types of effects, 
I think he's taking us into those spaces if we follow him in the text and if we follow sort of his methodology. Because there isn't a there isn't a philosophical methodology per se to get at those to articulate what it is, you know, what what is what is what is the width? What is that sense that there's somebody with you, that the, that you're not alone, that that you have a connection, right? I would almost start at the end of this chapter uh, to to look at really where it's going, uh, and I'll I'll bring it I'll bring it to that um, point. And um, I think it'd be actually useful to go from the end back to the very beginning because that first um, image that he presents of the um, the monochrome black experience, if you will, um, I think is an interesting entry point to the chapter that where I think actually he goes wrong, but. I'm, I'm going to go to the end. And he comes back at the very end of this chapter to the idea of language and the, the, the way in which language is a sort of, it's not an, um, we can understand it metaphorically as an umbilical cord, as some form of connection that we can trust, that we can trust if somebody, that if we say something, there's going to be a response. If we call out, there will be, if we call out for help, it will come. If we call out for food, milk, what have you, Sukkar, it will, it will come. And in these last lines, he says, um, he's talking about these two d- different communities. One is a kind of, um, ling- I guess, a linguist, a speaker, community of speakers, a community of people who, in my, understand- my reading, speak, hear, understand each other, maybe not understand, but respond to each other. And those who have lost uh, faith, if you will, in the uh the truth of that uh that particular that that process or scenario um and so he says this where the speakers do not succeed in convincing the not yet speakers the abandoned subjects the abandoned subject develops leanings towards going on a primal strike against the disappointing outside and its death tiresome and superfluous signs the ungreeted, unseduced, and unenlivened are, rightly, one is inclined to say, agnostic towards language and cynical about the idea of communion. They do not move into the house of being in the first place. For them, language remains the epitome of counterfeit money. Communication is nothing but the forger's attempt to bring their own duds into circulation along with all the others. So, the, so if, he, if he's going into then this primal witness, this primal sense of not being alone, of being in communion from the start, then how do we talk about that? And I think that what he's saying in this chapter is that there isn't a philosophical language per se. There isn't certainly a a rational language. It's non-reductionistic for um, getting a, forming some kind of sense of relationship of that in that space. And so we have to look into other areas. One of them is mythology or religion. uh, And the, uh, the, the Hildegard von Bingen example uh, being, being um, the one that he uses to illustrate that, and the other being art. And I, I would say he leaves out an important one, or he mentions it actually, um, but that's the poetry of it. And, and so there's a, that, that's, that brings us back to the beginning, because I think that he presents us in the beginning with a poetic sort of invocation of what this state, this space, this experience of being in the womb, but not alone, might be like. And, um, and that's where, you know, that, 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 I, I, think, I think it'd be interesting to, to, to start there. Uh, he, he talks about the black of the eye, the spheric eye that becomes like total, right? And he, and he, he goes again and again in, into this very poetic, imagistic um, evocation of what it might be like. But I don't think he's doing philosophy in a descriptive sense there. He's doing some form of magic, really. He's, he's trying to, to awaken a sense of an experience that we could not, we could not truly remember in, in rationally articulable terms. And um, I, I, like when I thought of, just to, I'll, I'll, I'll make one more point and then kind of head it off. Um, I thought that he was committing almost one of the same sins that he accuses modernity of committing because part of what modernity tries to do is to isolate uh, entities into their own things, starting with ourselves so that we're a a, a pure thing. Uh, We're a pure individual uh, or this is a pure object. Uh, And 
if he's using the idea of a, a black circle that becomes total as the, ap- the kind of primary object, then to me, that actually is a representation. It's a mental sort of abstract concept. Because if I close my eyes and I just really try to imagine what it's like or feel what it's like to be in the womb, I, kinda, I don't see a pure color. It's sort of a, maybe it's kind of reddish, actually. You know, it's sort of a reddish, bloody, kind of a diffuse obscurity. But for the purposes of this book, he gives it a particular, you know, and I, I, I think that that may have been kind of one of the places where he goes wrong, but it also points to, I think, the, the thing that's happening, which is that we're trying to look to the places where those distinctions first arise, then trace where they become reified. Uh, and if we can go back to before the reification happens or before the distinction happens, maybe we can sort of find a way to relate there that's less uh, fragment- fragmentary or less isolating. Uh, yeah, that's it. I, I wanted to respond to that, but I think someone else is on the call that hasn't spoken. Do we want to? I'm just making a note that I wanted to respond to that. But is TJ still here? No. I see him. Oh, okay. It, mm-hmm. I just wanted to be sure everyone had a chance to speak before I chime in again. Is, is my okay. audio any better? We're good. We can hear your voice. Okay. No, go ahead, John. Oh, okay. Um, now I forgot what I was going to say. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, oh, oh. Okay. there's something about the invocation. Here I'm just quoting from page 345. Um, the journey into the black land. Would it be helpful to assume the lotus position, close one's eyes and temporarily renounce all things visible and imagined? But how many have boarded the boat of meditation only to drift out into the immaterial where research ends in lack of curiosity? So I think that's the poetic evocation Mm. of of this night journey. Um, Whether it turns into uh, another nihilistic Nietzschean kind of despair, or is there a reunification? That's, I think, the open question that we're sort of dealing with here. And later he, he, he continues to say, um, whoever tackles this will soon understand that life is deeper than one's autobiography. Writing never penetrates far enough into one's own blackness. We cannot write down what we began as. So I think those are all very evocative. And I think what Mike was talking about earlier about how he takes uh, these different echoes within our culture of this, uh, you know, this nostalgia for perhaps a return to this oceanic bliss, which I do believe is a fantasy. Um, I think we're we're moving towards something that's probably in our future. And I'm drawing a lot on Wilbur and other developmentalists here. Um, But but the point I was trying to make, and I hope I can find it, Oh, a a personal anecdote. I think this has a lot to do with memory and what memory is and what we tend to remember. We tend to remember, we don't remember the lovely times we were running in the garden and smelling the flowers. We remember when we were slapped or hit or betrayed or denied. Those things get really hardwired in us. So what we remember is often, um, unfortunately, the fragmentation. And it's Part of our responsibility, I think, as as we become a part of our culture and members of a culture and we learn how to speak the language of the tribe, we have to do something that's very difficult, and that's we, we need to get um we need to get another perspective. And I remember Terence, I think McKenna said, culture is not your friend. Um and to varying degrees, this is going to be a, a project that each of us has to conduct on our own. Um, I mean, we may find allies along the way who can help us consolidate a certain breakthrough. If we don't find those allies who can help us consolidate a breakthrough, we'll probably continue on in a sort of rut that we're in or we'll probably, we may break down. And I think there's lots of evidence of people not being able to get to another level where, they, where they're able to integrate um, the mind-body conundrum. Anyway, um, I think he's, he's right now in the art grip of the archetype of the of the wanderer. Um, I'm a poor wayfaring stranger. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a very compelling archetype in our culture. 
I actually love it myself. <laughs> I mean, most of most of soul and blues and jazz and most of the art that I admire the most is very connected to this wandering archetype, this wanderer archetype. And, and there's nothing, I think it's a beautiful archetype as long as it's supplemented with the energies of other archetypes. I think we get into trouble when we get caught up in, in the, the, the power of an archetype. Um, and we must, I think, as rational uh, critical thinkers use archetypes, but the archetypes should not use us. So I am, I am a funny feeling he's sort of um, maybe he's taking that Nietzschean route, I think, that direction into the uh, nihilistic abyss and sort of wallowing in a little bit in this chapter. Um, I don't think he stays there. I have a feeling he gets, he starts to employ other archetypes like the lover and the beloved and all those. Anyway, that's my two cents. I hope that's of use to anybody here. <laughs> it's very confusing, I must admit. I, I'd like to be okay by respond. So, uh, echoing the last two, uh, John and Marco. First, Marco, I, I really appreciate the way you entered into uh, uh, the discourse and spirit of what he's doing and really clarified what discursive register, where he's operating, in relation to, I'd say, older continental philosophy. Because the group I'm part of is introducing non-duality and elementals and all of that stuff. John Salas's work, for example. Um, and to deal with this issue of the sayable and the unsayable. I really admire that. And I, with John, I resonate that I do get in this chapter a Nietzschean flavor to it. What I'd say sort of would be that I think the genealogy he's coming up with is very valuable. There's something to it. There's also something to these cultures using trees having to do with pre-industrial, <laughs> right? There are many ways of reading the appearance of trees and plants. If you want to get, you want to go direction even earlier, you could say maybe there's some memory of the exchange of chemicals and respiration between animals <laughs> and trees. And so, of course, that's the, there's lots of ways of reading this allegorically. Um, what I would say is that anyone writing on the scope has an explicit or tacit ontology of what reality is like. Mm. And what I don't get from him is a full enough set of resources. I feel a, a kind of constricted materialist, loosely, set of resources that I think are untrue on philosophical grounds. That's what I would say. And that talking about the etheric or subtle and causal and other facets, I think there are philosophical arguments grounded in contemporary evidence that can be made a case for that, that what I think in this chapter is his tacit ontology does not account for. That's what I want to say. I think these are always at stake. Baskar taught me that. Discourses always have tacit views of what the world is like. And um, so I, I disagree with him on that count. And it came out strong when he dismissed Stan, uh, Groff's work. Yeah. But I realized he did not understand because Groff stopped doing the LSD stuff early on when it became illegal in this country and, and substituted breath work. And I've read Groff, Groff's work very carefully and I spent time with Groff and his students did a lot of work. And I've been in those spaces with a lot of people and it is not true that people come up with stuff that they simply have read. It's right. just false. Mm -hmm. People come up with stuff that is coming from somewhere that can't be explained by sensory experience. I read this, therefore I know that. I think that it's not a fantasy, it's not magic, it's not, a, it's evidential in my experience. And I thought his dismissal of that was symptomatic of a truncated ontology and a refusal to take in domains that could be resources. That would be my take. Like California, he seems like he's never been there before. <laughs> well, that's got a lot of pre-trance, too. <laughs> the, 
it's so right what you say about his dismissal of Groff. I think that's really accurate. And that's where I got my first glitch. Like, oh, I don't know if this guy is going the direction I like. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for that. Well, it's also the dismissal of meditation as well. Uh, and, I mean, you, you said he'd been with Osho. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's not that he, you know, he has exposure uh, to um, spiritual communities or spiritual practice mm-hmm. in that sense. But there's that old, pre- it's a prejudice. Uh, and you find it in Nietzsche as well. Uh, but it, it was part of European intellectual culture that, uh, that Buddhism or Eastern philosophy is about, is about essentially nothing. It's about world um, denial or world you know, extinction. Uh, and of course, that's not the case. Uh, you could pr- be a, a very adept meditator and at the same time have profound intellectual curiosity. A, so that doesn't have to be dismissed as a um, methodology for entering into a, uh, a, a clearer relationship to elementals, right? Uh, so, yeah, but uh, on the positive side, I think that part of what he's also doing uh, is what, John, you called um, uh, offering a meta- using ourselves as metaphors, or using, right, like becoming our own metaphors, because if if we ha- if we need some kind of language for talking about uh, the unsayable uh, and talking e- even if we're talking about pro- post trans rational post rational types of experiences we still need a language for it and where are we drawing that language from well he's giving us uh, I mean he's giving us a, a very intimate language of our own embodiment uh, from from the initial like from the point where we become embodied right from our cellular existence fetal existence into being you know babies but that that all is um if we don't look at it merely from and this is part of what i think he's saying here merely from the kind of mechanistic rational scientific or um an anatomical uh level uh and look at it from the inside as well from not just from the third person perspective on the interior but a first person perspective uh, from of that interior from or through that interior uh the the womb the placenta the umbilical cord they all provide images metaphors and language for what we might what for, for experiences we could be having that are not retrogressive that are not just g- going back to something that was in the past but that are emergent and that are not reducible to uh infantile you know uh world escape uh, and he may, or may I, th- he, I find that he's sort of uh, on the edge, just kind of fluttering back and forth, not quite willing to believe <laughs> yet, in a, in a sense, not quite faithful in the, you know, the, the possibilities beyond uh, the, the rational and the reductionistic. Mm-hmm. But he's sort, of there, he's sort of kind of there, and he's actually providing some useful um, ways of talking about it or ways of accessing it. Well, I, what, given what I, I agree, I think he's an extremely original, valuable thinker. I think he's attuning us to just what you're talking about, offering us metaphors, where these things persist and so on. Uh, again, my, my worry about him is he's truncated his lack of faith in your language, Marco, and his, his lack of um, allowing for other dimensions or currents of being that are actually resources that can relieve some of the angst that I sense behind this in some ways. Mm. And, um, I, I don't think he's regressed in the service of transcendence yet. I get the feeling from this that he hasn't. Um, for one thing, memory, and I think his idea of what memory is is different from mine. Um, because we remember different things. Um, but I think, and then collectively, our, our memory gets even more complex because, you know, our culture edits and deletes and distorts quite a bit about what happened. Um, but not to personalize this too much, because I know that's a danger, but I think since he spent so much time with all these echoes, um, and I think that the Freudian legacy is basically the whole edible complex came out of Freud's inability to believe that so many people were reporting 
sexual abuse by their parents. So he said, no, this, these are false memories. And so the whole Oedipal complex comes out of this notion that there are false memories. Now, I'm not saying there aren't false memories. Obviously, cognitive psychology has taught us a lot about how people can pre-program us to respond in certain ways as to believe we, but we had certain experiences that we didn't have. But I think it's still an open research question. Um, and uh, since... Uh, and I recently, I, I don't know, I didn't read the study, but I read about it. There was a horrible incident where some children were kidnapped in a bus. And the bus was uh, buried in a sand pit out in the desert, in California desert somewhere. And that the children inside this bus went into, you know, there's that fight, flight, freeze response. They went into freeze, except for two boys who had the, who woke up out of this, trance this traumatizing trance and they um broke through the a glass window somehow and they got all the kids out before the sand collapsed the bus they did uh, uh, some therapists went down there and they studied the children and they all reported the same event very accurately so there was the possibility that people who are traumatized are actually reporting something that actually happened but one one of these therapists also posed the question that when a person has had many, multiple traumatic episodes, that's a very different kind of memory than one, one a person who has one, has a traumatic episode, they can report it accurately and there are enough corroborating witnesses to agree. So we have a consensus of reality there. But there are those who've had multiple traumas and they, you know, especially if, the chi if it's a child or someone in war, um, you can um, at, and anticipate a, a traumatic episode before it happens. So that's a different kind of memory. And I think, um, you know, in our, in our uh, the world that we're living in now with the internet age, what it is, I believe we're often um, being all these multiple images of disaster are, are taking its toll upon our nervous systems. So unless we find in our individual ways of clearing ourselves, we may be taking a lot of baggage on that doesn't belong to us. But as, a, as an aside, I had a memory, a traumatic memory. I won't tell you what it was, but it happened at night. Both of my parents were present. Many years later, my father wanted to know why I was so hostile to him. And I told him that memory. And he said, yes, that happened. And it happened just the way you described it. I told my mother about that memory. She didn't remember it at all. So I learned my father, although I don't like him, I can share a reality with this man. My mother, although I love her, we don't share a reality. And that was very important for me as, a, as an adult to say, I am a part of and apart from both of these people. And I'm a lucky man. I feel myself extremely blessed because I had had I had a peer group and I had enough people who were supporting me. But I think a lot of people are not so blessed. They're not so lucky. And they get drowned in all these miscommunications and distortions. But I think ultimately we have to find that relationship to the dynamic ground. And when we can, I believe these seizures and these cracks that everyone has to some extent can be we can be re we can be reintegrated. The but the ego, as Washburn says. Re is a re is a reintegrated. Uh, so there's a kind of resurrection phase, if we're lucky. Um, and I do think this is, as Washman says, a very long term, um, intensive project with lots of uh, ups and downs. So it doesn't have that uh, Wilberian kind of going up the ladder and getting a new perspective and transcending, including then going up the ladder a little more. No, no. <laughs> Washburn's model is not like that at all. And I find it much more persuasive based upon my own experience. So just throwing that out there, guys. I didn't mean to be a downer, but. <laughs> no, not at all. No, no. It's, uh, it's okay. We could kind of let things sit for a moment. We, we're sort of a, uh, we're an uncongealed cheese here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what who let's see what curdles. I think Ed is gonna he looks like he's about to curdle. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, um, 
I, I have to admit that Mr. Slaughterdike uh, amazes me every once in a while. Not 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 by his brilliant insights as Michael likes to see it, but because of his ineptitude. Um, <laughs> um, whereby, I, I will add, I I'm not I'm not advocating that those two are far apart. I, I think there's a fine line between them, just like genius and insanity. You know, I, I don't always know which side of the line they're on or that even Sloterdijk may be on. There's times when I'm look, reading him and I'm going, oh, maybe he's getting it. And then I, and then I find, and, and, and Michael pointed this out very, very aptly, the assumptions and the presuppositions that you make, that you, that you never articulate, determine what it is that you're saying. And, and Sloterdijk is probably one of the writers, uh, one, I'm not going to say few writers, but really there hasn't been a whole lot where it's almost impossible impossible for me to nail down what those are. I, I have a very strong feeling that he's exceedingly materialistic, but doesn't really want to be. Almost as if he's afraid not to be. And I, and I think that one of the things, whether you're going to be an artist or a philosopher, is what you need is courage. And I, I find that Sloterdijk lacks courage. He doesn't, he doesn't say what he needs to say when he needs to say it. He, he, he kind of veers off and he averts. And, 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 and I think that undermines what it is that he's trying to communicate, though I, I can't disagree with anything that I've heard thus far. But there's this, there's this sense that you just can't, you can't nail him down. He's talking about things that are spiritual, but I don't be believe that he believes in spirituality. It's like you said, he, he was, he's part of a group that meditated, but I don't think he got what meditation was about. And so he, he says a lot of things that, and that's where, in my words, he's not making sense anymore, where I, where I just kind of lose the, that, that whole path because I would really like to, to be, not to nail him down to say, oh, but you said this, but simply to understand where he's coming from. You know, I don't know how you can, you can wallow in psychoanalysis and be so, ad, 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 you know, abhorred by it and so adverse to it and how these guys never got anything right, you know, which he has wanted to say many, many times. Again, when I'm reading this chapter, how many times did he say, well, these people didn't get it right. And they missed the point. And the, the, you know, and, and, and I have, to me, his negative gynecology was was not negative in the sense that I'm negative as I'm being perceived most of the time, but he's trying to make an inversion where maybe one isn't necessary. And and I and I I appreciate that that metaphorically, getting back to our roots and the the, the source of our being and whatever can be very very valuable, but I'm not sure that the path that he's chosen with personifying an organ is the way to go. I, I don't know what that gets me. Why didn't he personify the heart when he was talking about the heart as an organ? That, that wasn't important then. And he didn't, he didn't personify um, in any way, this fluidity that, that came up in that all mesmer discussion. He, doesn't, he didn't personify, personify that. But now that we're getting really down to a place that we can describe as pre-linguistic, but it may be pre-awareness. It may be pre-anything that we conceive of. And the only way that we can know that is if we make clear what our assumptions are. To me, for example... We'll take we'll take the mammals. He makes this statement. He goes in, in the in, in the animal world, um, mothers either reabsorb placentas or eat them, for the most part. Well, that tells me that in the animal world, placentas are more mother than than offspring. But he's telling us that when it comes to humans, although it's not clear that he's making a distinction. Placentas are more offspring than they are mothers. And I, I go, well, how do you get there? Other than you, you just postulated as such. 
you, you say that's how it is. And given that, on that basis, I can make certain directions. And then the rest of his analogies fall into place. I think you're taking him too literally at that point. I mean, he's, I don't think he's making a strong commitment. I don't think he's making a strong proposition that that's the way reality is. I mean, he's really writing about how people have read reality. He's writing about how we, how we have thought culturally uh, about uh, these phenomena rather than, I think, even what he thinks. I don't think he knows what he thinks in all the, these cases. I mean, I don't think he has a strong proposition to make. But I'm very curious what... Uh, to, to, I think this may tie back to, to your point, Ed, to what you're getting at. I'm curious what Michael thinks is Sloterdijk's tacit ontology, because if we can clarify that, maybe we'll have some basis for... I, I think that would be would help. Yeah. I'm having trouble with that. I, I agree with you on that, that point. That was actually the essence of what I wanted to say. Thank you, Marco. But somebody knows what I'm saying here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know what his tacit ontology is. It seems wobbly. Mm-hmm. You know, I think you can um, read certain philosophers and they don't actually state their ontology, but you can infer mm-hmm. it. Yeah. I'm thinking of one classic example where I was reading um, Richard Rorty years ago. Yeah. And I went, oh, he's assuming this. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And then reading Baskar years later, two decades, a decade later, and going, oh, it's a human, it's a human, human assumption. And mm-hmm. it really is there. And so it's, it's, you know, with Rorty, he's making assumptions about the body, how sensory things hit it, and language's relation to it. With Sloterdijk, I don't, like, yeah, I, I like other people. He's sort of a materialist. He's sort mm-hmm. of touching on spirituality. For me, there comes a point where there's a normativity question, which he is foregrounding a question of what we value and which direction we go. And if I don't have a clear sense of what the ontological stakes are for the author, I have trouble grokking why I should be committed to a certain value direction of addressing certain issues. I'm not clear about the diagnosis, and I'm not clear about the suggested resources for addressing the diagnosis, if any. And so far... Now, I want to read all his work. You know, I, I really do. I think he's an original thinker. I do think that. But he's wobbly to me. Mm. It's just... But isn't this... Uh, Michael, isn't this about what meta-philosophy is? I mean, or a meta-reality that Bashkar was talking about. Um, he seems This seems to be philosophy about philosophy. And he is looking, I think, at cultural shadow rather than personal shadow. Um, but I think most of us, if we do enough work on our own shadow, we're going to be confronting the culture's shadow as well. And then beyond that, we're dealing with the species, the shadow of our species in relationship to other species. So it doesn't seem to be something that we, um, we ever going to finish um, as long as we're working on this planet. So anyway, I'm just putting that out there, how metaphilosophy... Uh, meta psychology. I think we're all going into meta land quite a lot, <clears throat> and I think he 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 probably gets a little lost for me in meta land because he doesn't seem to, uh, you know, concretize much of this in some sort of narrative. But that's my style. I'm definitely a storyteller. I like narrative. He's an. I think he's very poetic, a kind of thinker, and I and I am engaged with the metaphors. I think if we. You know, we get this metaphorical landscape that he's playing with, with the tree and the Magritte and um, the, the, those two paintings, um, something, uh, infinite rec- re- recognition, and the other painting is the voice of blood. I believe he, he's looking at those paintings and he's working with the cultural shadow, I think, of himself and Magritte in relationship. So, um, and he's also talking about Hildegard and... Uh, the, what he's called the, the high older vision discourses. I think he's trying to figure out what the hell a vision could be. You know, if people perish without a vision, I think we're in deep, deep shit right now. <clears throat> but what is a vision? A vision certainly isn't a mission statement. And I, think, <laughs> and, and I think we get too many mission statements without any vision. We're going to, we're going to go into a, a deeper, um, there's nothing left but a black hole. You know, and, and we don't know enough about that either. I mean, what do we know? I mean, physicists, 
physicists are now saying most of the universe is made of uh, black matter. What is what the, what is that? No one seems to know. So it just seems to me. I love what Bateson said that we are thousand times more ignorant than we think we are. <laughs> <laughs> we are very we're we are riding on a swarm of the invisible you know so um i i i appreciate how frustrating this is for ed and myself because i i tend to be a very perceptual concrete kind of guy so um uh and a certain amount of abstraction i enjoy and i can participate in but if it doesn't come back to some sort of narrative mm -hmm. it seems to me you can get lost in metal land and most philosophers are in metal land pretty much forever and if we want to find something pragmatic out of this, I'd be really, well, what would that be? Um, so anyway, sorry if I, I drifted off a little bit in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> but these are my concerns as well. Um, and I think this is whether you're going to be an art artist or philosopher, I think, Ed, you mentioned. Which mm -hmm. one? What if you want to be both? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I know. I, I, I think part Marco's point is well taken. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, because I feel this myself, that I do take him too literally too often. But I have the problem that Michael pointed out, that his ontology is so wobbly, I don't know where I am once I, once I leave that concreteness. So, because it's, it's, it stops making real sense. And I, it's very hard for me to piece, put one piece together with the other. I find, I find most of his interpretations of things highly contrived. You know, you, you just put things together because it seems to fit for you. But in light of what you said before, given that, that all fits. I, I, I see that. But what if I what if I don't see that? Well, then I miss the point. And he's he, he is very, very clear in many, many places. If you don't get the point, you're at the wrong place. And I'm going, well, OK, well, maybe I'm in the wrong place. Maybe I shouldn't be reading this. You know, maybe I'm not the person you're talking to. I would like to know what he's saying, and I do find it a little disappointing when people put things out there that they don't want people to understand. I, I also find that very complicated. You know, well, well, why do that? You know, just just say this is my group. He kind of tried to do that at the beginning, in the very very first pages with his with his. Well, Ed, what I would yeah. ask you is, do you think he's trying to deceive you, or do you think no. he self deceived? So I, I, self deception, or is he trying to? I, I don't get self deception. I don't get deception here. No, I don't. I don't, like I don't say. I'm not, I, I hope you don't know. That was never my intention to imply yes. that Mr. Slaughterdyke was deceiving anyone. I think he's doing the best he can with what he's got. I, I, I do too. I do too. That that's, that's my default I'm position. Doing. That he's trying real hard. I, yeah. I don't get him, and I am trying to explain why I don't. Well, and, you know. I, I had an experience, I, a musical friend of mine, very good musician, we went to a recital together. And after the recital, he said about the singer, he said, her posture was terrible. And I went, well, she sounded like she was really good. And he said, mm -hmm. her posture indicated she had no respect for the composer. Mm -hmm. and to me, I thought, oh, okay, well, he knows music better than I do. But I understand that, that the mm -hmm. singer is not a critic of the composer. Mm -hmm. And you, a, a good singer is behind the music, not in front of it. Mm -hmm. This is true of all good performers. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that's true of good readers as well. I mean, we have to find a way, if even a writer we don't like, I think we have to respect yes. the attempt here. Yes. Unless you really feel like it's Das Kapital or something really horrible, mm -hmm. <laughs> or a uh, Mein Kampf, uh, mm -hmm. or something just totally yeah. propagandistic. Um, and I sort of like want to cut this, give him an opportunity to make mistakes in public as he's doing, mm -hmm. and sort of maybe he could be exposing something, you know, in our in our um, mutual misunderstanding about our culture. Or what I, we're I, doing. I don't I don't disagree with anything that you said, John. Um, yeah. and I, and I, I'm saying I, I'm getting from you that you are respecting our yeah, struggle. I, yeah, I think I think he's trying real hard. I just think he's failing all the time. <laughs> and that may be true. That, yeah, yeah, and part of that is, and I, and, and this is this is the self-reflective part of that. Part of that is, I think Marco pointed out, maybe I am reading him too literally. He made a Marco made a statement in the in the forum a couple of oh, about a week ago, last time, about about aesthetics, and and I took that to heart, and and so I've been I've been 
mulling over how how I feel about how I understand and what I understand aesthetics to be in order to see, well, maybe that's an avenue to get a better understanding of what's going on. But in the end, when I when I get lost in all of that, because I'm trying to figure out a couple of things at one time, in the end, you're kind of left with the words that are on the page. Yeah. And when and when he contradicts himself, I'm going, well, okay, I'm, I know you're trying. I mean, I have that problem with my two and a half year old uh, grandson because he cannot communicate the way he would like to. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not, and, and, and the false analogy was intense because, and this is what I hear John saying, sometimes we don't really know what we want to say ourselves. Right, right. right. You know, I, I think that's true. I think it that's, that's true to all of us, you know. <laughs> I, I certainly, John admitted it was true for him. I will be the next one to stand up and go, okay, my name is Ed Moore, and I don't always know what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> I, I'd like to. I, and I, actually, I see, T, can, if we can give TJ a chance, because I see him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, Got to shout, TJ. I have to shout still? I can hear you. I can I hear you now. Go for okay, it. Good. No, I was just, I was wondering, um, I wish I had more background in this very powerful German academic philosophical tradition. Yeah. It's sort of like kind of, it's like he's, he's hearing shadows behind him, you know, Freud and Nietzsche and all these powerhouse philosophers and thinkers behind him. Is he trying to kind of hedge his bets a little bit? Do you get a sense of that at all? I guess this is more for people who are more familiar with the, who he, who, who is his audience? Who is he, who is he, you know, trying to impress or, Convince, you know? actually. <laughs> yeah, that was I, think that's a, I think it's a great, great question, right? Like, what degree is he suffering from what the Yale critic Harold Bloom called the anxiety of influence? Yeah. Uh, and there's another way we could shape it. Similar question is, it seems like we're pointing to what actually, what kind of discourse is this? There is something philosophical about it. Yeah. There is something genealogical in a very way, in Nietzsche's and Foucault's sense. He loves Foucault. There is something artistic or aesthetic about it. So there's a poeticizing set of moments that are blended in, and he juxtaposes images, which sometimes he doesn't even speak about. So in that sense, he reminds me of some fa facets of Walter Benjamin, who never completed a project called The Arcades, in which... He wanted to juxtapose analytic language and imagery and cultural artifacts to spark, he called this the dialect, to spark an insight that could not be directly reached through direct languages of any kind. And so I wonder if there's a Benjaminian moment in this. So it, it's raising what is the status of the discourse itself, mm -hmm. you know, um, for me, it, it does. Yeah. And then... It, yeah, is he just trying to be original for its own sake? Mm -hmm. I would propose, uh, this phrase came to me, it's not original, but it came to me as I was reading uh, yesterday, that it may not be as, it may be of limited uh, utility to read the text in, uh, in the terms of one particular uh, mode of reading or, or genre or discourse like to read it as philosophy strictly i think is a mistake it's not just that uh to read it as poetry obviously doesn't work either because it purports to be philosophical it purports to make certain claims or to develop an ontology of some kind of ology multiple ologies sphere spherologies uh and um it's not just art it's not just aesthetic but it has elements of all of those and to me, I mean, the, the discipline that is most, I think, uh, most versatile, uh, most suited perhaps to integrating, to coalescing multiple readings like that, multiple modes of reading like that would be literary studies or even media studies, but li li more literary because uh, you know, Slaughterdyke is extremely steeped in, in language. Uh, and he's, a lot of this is about language. It's about what the use of language is or what the more than use but the constitutive or the the cohering force that it may have or may no longer have um 
I don't know what that's called. <laughs> um, there's, the, I mean, to, I, I do think it's useful to look back, go back to that image that you brought up, John, the Magritte painting, because it's of a tree, and inside of the tree, there's like little doors open up. It's like a closet. There's a house. There's a sphere, and there's another door that's kind of unopened. It's shadowy. But then he, he on page this is page three seventy three in the English text, he um, he says at some point one looks past the tree's intimate sphere. So if we were reading this in Gibsonian terms, the tree would kind of be the magical, some you new know, narrative coming through the leaves, but then you have the mental, you know, kind of, I guess, incubated within it, you know, that, but you look beyond that. So at some point, it looks past the tree's intimate sphere into the distance, which surprisingly transpires as a genuinely liberated zone. Okay, and here I think he's making a claim. A deep river landscape opens up with mountain ranges on the left and an open plain on the right. I mean, he's reading the image. It is a landscape without the burden of symbols or the gravity of riddles. In order to reach it, one would have to break out of the sonic circle in the foreground in which the voice of blood rules over everything. Would it be entirely mistaken then to suppose that the artist himself is hiding in this blue distant space from where the artist, and I would think may, maybe the philosopher, from where a little willfully and without faith in his own symbols. With a little willfully and without faith in, in his own symbols. Yeah. Yeah. He presents the figures in the foreground to his viewers like false riddles. So this is a, this is a, a metaphor for Slaughter Dyke's own discourse? Maybe, yeah. And maybe. his position with respect to the discourse that he's engaging. Yeah. I have, I have to admit... A similar thought crossed my mind when I read precisely that passage. I said, who is that hiding out there? (laughs) 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 You know, you can't have resurrection unless you've gone through the crucifixion. So uh, I think in every transformational process, you go from stable to unstable to very unstable. Mm -hmm more than wobbling, you crash and burn. Mm -hmm. And then from the ashes arises the phoenix. Now that could be something that he's working through in this text. I hope so. (laughs) I hope we get to read this. (laughs) But in that that way, these hell realms that he's exploring here, and I think, I mean, it's very unstabilized to read this text. It was, I mean, this particular chapter. Previous chapters, I really, I found out very, uplifting in some ways but this one i find very um heavy and uh, unstabilizing hmm. and yet i'm also uh, you know i want to join with him mm-hmm. go with this night journey wherever it goes see what happens because i do think he's doing something magical and i think he's got a lot of talent this guy mm-hmm. here we are we're hanging out with him for a while mm-hmm. so i'm just opening that up as, but I'm sort of driven by aesthetics, and so um, I'm willing to I'm willing to wobble and crash and burn if I can get to the the juice of that resurrection. Okay, so he he's still he's still the theme that I'm still getting is is he's this isolation, the individualism as the modern age describes it. He's still on his attack of that. Mm-hmm. Um, Page 387, in terms of its psychodynamic source, the individualism of the modern age is a placental nihilism. I don't know what placental nihilism is, but I mean, he's still kind of, that's the theme I'm still getting from this whole thing. So I'll hang on to that thread. Mm-hmm. <laughs> By the way, TJ, I can hear you really well right now. Oh, okay, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, I, 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 made a, I adjusted a couple of settings. It's some magic. Okay. You're doing yeah, something you right. <laughs> you got it now. But you just found a quick voice. Re- Okay. I can stop shouting. <laughs> just a quick rejoinder to, to John. This is the first chapter where I didn't want to throw the book. Wow, we're making progress. <laughs> <All right>. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just- I'd like to respond to TJ. I, I, I think that is an underlying theme. Yeah. A philosophical trope. Remember, he is linking this to a Heideggerian, a response to Heidegger. So there is a philosophical background to this. And... Um, He's trying to extend it. He's against the isolated subject, the Cartesian, even more so the Kantian sort of this isolated region. And he sees it not just philosophically, he sees it as actually something materializing, not just discursively, but people feel isolated or foam or whatever you want to call it. 
the question I'd have is he throwing out the baby with the bathwater? Is there not some grounds of development here I could use sort of Spiral Dynamics and Wilbur that the movement into forms of ego autonomy don't necessarily mean that it's all bad, that they're actually, you know, in intensified agency, reflexive self-creating, um, aren't, maybe it's overemphasized, but is it simply a mistake? Is there not something developmentally emergent and valuable in that? And, and so what I don't get here often is what, this is going to sound really strange, what an adult would look like. Mm -hmm. With all the focus on placenta, with all the focus on children, wombs, the psychoanalysts don't know what they're talking about. I don't get a sense of what a mature earth dweller, um, empowered, vital, looks like. Mm. But maybe it's a self that's connected spherically with all the other influences, cultural, natural, that are, you know, part of part of part of the subject would be that kind of taking in of all the things that are that are influenced. And that might require more ego autonomous, quote unquote, like which is capacity. true because you need a center, right. Right, exactly. Right. Or relationally. But still right. having a sense of this this self developed steering to use Freud's term. Yeah, yeah I, I, I just not finding where the the pros of being a grown up out of the womb, <laughs> where, where the gifts of development are. I'm not hearing any of that. Yeah, and I think Michael, you pointed out Michael Washburn's work, and I think Michael Washburn does develop this. He does, and he speaks very eloquently to this. Um, the way we, well. Looking at this text, um, on page 353, uh, Schlotterdijk says, whatever might take place between mother and child, the two do not form a soundless meditation group at any point in their interaction process. I think he's still making fun of California there. But there's this, um, there's something that Washburn says about the lower chakras or the, the, the anus and the gut. We keep out mother and her invasiveness by shutting down the lower body. And we need to do that in order to make this very healthy differentiation between mother and our, our, our autonomous egos. But the ego represses that. And it takes a long, long time to let that lower body, the neuromuscular locks that are habitual, the ego requires that. To have an ego, you have to have that sense of separation before those neuromuscular locks can relax. And when that happens, and it happens in men and women, spiritual awakening, awakening is, is just relaxing the lower body. When that happens, we feel all kinds of uh, energies that sometimes are very uh, frightening because we think we may be overwhelmed by this. But eventually, I think it stabilizes and just becomes a a sense of being blessed and a sense of being peaceful and being serene. You can still be a fucked up person. It doesn't mean you don't make mistakes and you may not have enormous psychic gifts all of a sudden. But I think that's where the healthy, stable earth dweller, I think you said, Michael, I think Washburn really maps this particularly well. And I don't know if our author has, is going to be able to do this. Maybe he will. Uh, Cause he's taking on the whole, the globe itself, the whole, what's happening on at the macro level. I think he's doing that in the next chapters. I mean, in the next book. Anyway, so those are my big question marks here. And I also believe uh, Washburn does a very good, uh, very good case, makes a very good case for what a mature uh, functioning adult could be. Thank God I had um, read that book or I'd be in real trouble. <laughs> he's, well, we, I have to, I, I'm, I feel like uh, compelled to jump in because Go for he it. talks about adulthood yeah. here. I mean, he talks, a, he, he makes a, a statement about what an adult might be like, or rather what an adult wouldn't be like. Uh, and, and he, and he also, um, and he also speaks about the sacrifices that one makes in the process of development. This the cast, he puts in, he doesn't put, he quotes who's, 
you know, of course, quoting Freudian psychoanalysis in terms of putting it as castration, right? So we shut down certain communions in order to open up the other communion. And it's necessary to do that. It's necessary to stop believing in Santa Claus in order to have a more mature relationship with, you know, a, um, a, a giver, the, 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 the giver of gifts uh, or, you know, uh, the, ma- the magical kind of being. Um, and the part about adults, I mean, what he says then, placenta, an adult does not just treat those, that process of lost, doesn't, doesn't simply kind of, doesn't treat it as mere matter, mere material. In other words, willing and ready to see its significance, uh, is willing to let it go, but, but also to preserve something of the original energy of it. If, if there's, some, there's something that, that can, even though it may be very, very far in the distance, right? it may be very, very subtle, it may be, un, you know, it may be inexpressible, uh, that an, an adult would through the process of renouncing or letting go of smaller communions in, in order to open up into lar- larger ones. I don't know if small, large is exactly right, but uh, more realistic ones, even. Less, you know, narciss- narcissistic or less fantastical. I think, he sa- I think he's including these little clues that... Uh, that let us know that he's thinking about development. And he's not just bringing us to to a regressive place. That that he does recognize that the, that these primal that are, are the placenta does have to be. Uh, you know, we can't keep the the actual placenta with us as we grow grow up. But somehow, the way that we relate to it is important. And there's something about an adult, mature way of dealing with these prior, these magical realities, the other structures in Gebserian terms. I mean, I think that's a very integral kind of, sent, you know, orientation, actually. I, I think what you're saying is very integral and more, and mm-hmm. I resonate with. My sense is, and I think it's a generous, close reading of Slaughter Dyke, but I'm not clear what degree it's Slaughter Dyke, mm-hmm. right? What degree it isn't an Uh, your consciousness amplifying what might be breadcrumbs into a wider integrative vision. Mm. That's what I would say. I mean, I love what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I'm not, and it it may be what Slaughter Dyke is doing, Mm -hmm. but I'm not clear. I still, on on my side, I'm not clear Slaughter Dyke is actually doing that Mm -hmm. because he dismissed developmentalisms in an earlier chapter. Mm -hmm. And he's not speaking about the developmental space he's coming from or Mm -hmm. philosophers are coming from that enable this kind of analysis. He's not reflecting, at least in part, on the conditions of possibility of his own engagement, which would have to do with the kind of themes he's talking about, development and so on. So you could be completely right. Mm -hmm. I love what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And it resonates with my (laughs) sense of the genealogy of this is really vital not to suppress that he's mm-hmm. uncovering, he's unearthing something, right? It's an archeology span here. Yeah. And, and I mean, to, the, uh, to go back to the Magritte painting, he, he's also, um, how to put this, uh, trying to maybe break a spell or break certain spells because in so far as we, um, have these kind of unresolved and irreconciled, unreconciled uh, pieces of us, you know, that have been kind of blown apart, you know, he calls it fission, right? Invokes this kind of nuclear explosive. Uh, When our kind of separative mentality reaches back even to before we existed and posits us, like TJ was saying, as isolated egos from the get go, uh, like, I, I, I think he's, I mean, part of the idea of going beyond the voice of the blood, which is containing in that image, the mental, the house of language, the mental sphere, uh, is that, uh, that 
and like he says, it's a liberated zone. Like we're not under the influence anymore, but part of be, not part of coming to the place where you're no longer under the influence has to, I think, involve this genealogy, this uh, re- negative gynecology, this reverse psychoanalysis, where we sort of undo or get to like the heart of the knots that have manifested in the experience of reality that we have, where we presume at fundamental levels and fundamentally unspoken levels that we are separate, fund- that we are separate, uh, that our be- that being is singular and not uh, inclusive of the of the other from from the from the beginning uh, and so he's I, I see him opening the space i don't see him providing a vision like wilbur has a vision right e- even if it's a, a ladder and it's a grid what have you it's this vision that humanity or you know humanity can involve you know from lower stages of development to higher stages from less inclusive to more inclusive, et cetera. And you can extrapolate a world out of, you know, a whole universe out of, out of that vision. Uh, where Soderlich seems to leave us is more in the liminal space, more in the shadowy space. I mean, that, that background to the painting is, uh, it's, it's not a visionary space. It's, it's sort of a, maybe it's a gestational space. I mean, maybe it's a, it's a place from which a vision can arise. And, and that, that, I think, is the use for me out of this, is that the critical capacity to kind of look into discourses the way that he does and see them, present them in their non-conclusiveness, their indeterminacy, uh, and to, you know, even have a little bit of an aloofness, you know, a little bit of that kind of philosophical distance uh, may be useful to kind of getting us to the place where we even have the space for a vision. Uh, and you know, we're generally not, I think culturally not in, in that space at all, because we're really just awash in the, you know, the, the flood of meaningless signifiers, you know? And so we even lost faith that there could be a vision. We lost faith that there could be something beyond. Um, I, I would just like to add something to that. Um, cause we talk a lot about vision. Um, and then there's, I think the, the visionary, and the critic and the realist are different functions that can be coordinated, but they, it's a, you have to have them all at the same table. You wanna have some coordination going on. If you just have a visionary and a critic, it's a waste of everybody's time. <clears throat> and if the realist is actually there to listen to the, the, the positive intention behind the critique so that the realist can translate that in terms that the visionary can understand. <laughs> so this is a very useful strategy. And then the visionary can take the criticism and develop a, a healthier and more complex vision. But when you just have a critic going after, critics, by the way, do not have visions. Critics do not dream. They criticize, they evaluate, they point out what's missing. And we need all, we need all of this to function well within ourselves and with each other. So I'm sure we've all been in meetings where there's just someone's coming up with great ideas and someone's there shooting them all down. And I think that could happen to us as we read this text, if we don't realize, I think he's a bit of a wanderer. He's capturing, I think, the, the shadow side of our culture, which the wanderer is very prevalent. He's also, uh, he, he looks at the lover, and I, I think he's not, as, as I've been listening to everyone talk, I think there's a bit of a magician in him, a very strong magician. And all these archetypes, the lover, the, the child, uh, the magician, the wanderer, they all have a positive side and they have a dark side. So I'm not sure it, what kind of magician he is. <clears throat> but I think you need, if you're going to have a vision, you have to have a magician. You have to have a, that magician who can invoke bring up the ancestors, tell stories. Um, so I think that's a sort of uneasy, something very uneasy about where he is right now. I think he's getting sucked in, he gets sucked in, I think, too much into the dark side of the wounded child. I think the wounded child is a very creative, useful archetype, but I think he gets really sucked into it. That's the way I'm reading him right now. Um, but I think there's enough juice flowing through this text that I, I find it's compelling. It's a compelling read, so I'll keep, keep at it. 
But I picked up on the magician today as I was listening to everyone talk. I thought, oh, wow, this guy's weaving. I think he's weaving a spell, Marco. I think you were, you were talking about him breaking a spell. I think he's weaving, he's creating spells. You, you have to break one spell to weave another, perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> perhaps. That's the job of a good magician, to be, be able to pull that off. Uh, we're kind of almost at the end of our uh, scheduled time. And so why don't we start wrapping up? I have a couple of just points of order. I, I found it useful, Michael, to have your introduction. And I wonder if maybe we could, if, if we're going to keep reading this, I would like to. Uh, and I'd like to at least get to the end of this book. And then, you know, maybe we, at that point, we could reevaluate, see who really wants to do it, who wants to continue on, maybe... There's a better time even. I would love it if I've talked with Bruce Alderman. Uh, Michael, you mentioned him earlier. And uh, he just can't, he would like to read this with us. He can't make it at this time. Uh, I would, he'd be a wonderful person to include in these I agree. discussions. Um, but let's make it through the end of this book, <laughs> at least, and then, and then reevaluate. Um, We've however, come this far. We've got to finish yeah, it. Yeah, of course. Oh, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> this, this has been a, a bubble. Th- this, these conversations have been a bubble that I've always felt a, kind of tremulous. Like, mm-hmm. is it going to pop, you know, this week? If it's going to pop the next week? I'm trying to keep it, you know, inflated uh, mm-hmm. as long as possible um, just because. Uh, but I, I'd like to propose that we maybe take turns. And each week, one of us takes the lead in terms of given the opening statement, if you will, which could set the direction for the conversation. And we can open it up as we will, but uh, it'll let us sort of harvest our, I don't know, inclinations, our, our hint, our, uh, um, uh, yeah, just the kind of particular particularities or peculiarities even of how we're reading the text, bring those into the space. And then, of course, we'll all take it where we will. Um, so would that be acceptable to everyone? Would, yeah. And, and if so, would anyone want to volunteer to, to lead the next group? And by lead, I just mean like kick off. I, I volunteer Ed. Well, <laughs> I was just going to volunteer myself to go absolutely last. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been, you've been um, if not volunteered, you've been nominated. Nominated. Nominated to be the next spe- speaker of the house here. You can volunteer yourself. <laughs> <laughs> or not <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, I'll, I'll say I'll say a few yeah. I'll say. okay you kick us off and thank and, you and, uh, thank you remember when I asked if you might write, write a poem just throwing it out there mm-hmm. maybe, maybe. I'll, 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 okay. I'll, I'll, I'll I'll do my best not to be too literal <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> but, but since we are kind of wrapping up and, and I, I have the, the floor right now, I, I do want to say, I, I, like I said the last time, I really appreciate these get togethers because that's, that's what keeps me reading. Um, I, I've thought every week, this is the last, or every two weeks, this is the last time I'm just, I'm not doing this. Anymore. But, but I keep going on with this. And, and every time I find something, something new and something helpful, Michael's introduction was extremely helpful. Your comments were extremely helpful. Johnny come, p- popping in every once in a while to say, but did you think of this? You know, which, of course, I didn't because nobody's thinking of that except John. <laughs> but it's good because we then realize, well, actually, we kind of thought that but probably dismissed it. You know, th- those are the kinds of things that I always see John bringing in 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 here that are that are very helpful. So I'll say a few words. It won't be many. Uh, I will do my best to to not be my normal commodity commodity commud- self. Yeah. All right, uh, it's so that was it's, my sum up. It's but we need it too. I mean, I, I think want you to be a commodity. I just want you to do it better than you've ever done it. Before. Okay, all right, all right. I got to be do a more. <laughs> Uh, I'm not exactly sure how that is. Maybe I have to go to Comudgeons Anonymous. All right. All right. Good. All right. So uh, I I do want to give Wendy a chance to, you don't have to take it, but if there's anything as the, I nominated you to be the placenta. uh, Although we, we, you know, we should have just shut up and sat here if that were to be the case. Um, We didn't talk about that at all, by the way, the, the, the little scene that he describes of the analyst and the, uh, the patient yeah. who shows up and the yeah anyway um 
Do, do you want to, do you, we've just been here talking not so much about gynecology and such, but it's probably be good if you at least say something. Are you frozen? Oh my gosh. She, she froze. One the one sign you get. That. This must be a sign. Of something. <laughs> She'll come back. All so, right. Could I? Could I say something? I'd like to. Yeah. I. I think for myself, my sense is that Slaughter Dyke. Uh, there's four books to read of Slaughter Dyke to understand what his project is. That um, unfortunately, it's thousands of pages of reading in order to really discern what the sort of open gestalt is. And that's the Sphere tri Trilogy and then the um, You Must Change My Life, a text. And um, where it's more programmatic in some ways. And uh, so, I hold that everything I'm saying about a wobbly ontology, I, I, I'm also holding that I mm. haven't gone through his project. Mm. He just happens to write a lot because he's genealogically very concrete layering and so on. And that to really make an assessment of Slaughterdyke would require on my behalf to go through a large part of that, that reading. And that Bubbles is clearly just a third of part of that, you know, just so... Yeah, I, I think we're reading a fragment of his work in a sense. Mm -hmm. And we also have to go back in a way, like in, in terms of like the moment that we're in culturally, socio sociopolitically, et cetera. I mean, there's a lot of concern with, there's not so much concern with our, you know, you, with our I, I, embodiment, uh, with our inner you know, organs uh, and with the, our in-depth psychology. It's kind of not, I mean, even when we first were talking about reading this book with Johnny and Ed, we thought, well, let's jump ahead to, to volume two or three, because that's sort of more where we're at uh, in terms of the kind of wider uh, discourse. Uh, but really, we really did have, I think, have to do go back to this port because, because part of, I think, the, I, the morphological understanding of the later shapes has to do with getting a feel for I don't like that term that much, getting a feel for, but getting a feel for the the more the, the discarded uh, aspects <laughs> of our psyche. Uh, and, um, and the ways in which, why, the ways in which that may be fueled even by, by a, um, a pathology. And I, I, and I think that might be part of what he's getting at as well. I mean, there's something of a cultural physician or a cultural um, mm -hmm. diagnostician that that's involved here as well. Like, why do we, why do we treat the placenta that way? Why, why are we so disgusted by it? Uh, why don't we have a place for it in our culture? You know, why don't we have a place for our own bodies in our culture in some way? Is it because we're sort of preparing for this, you know, hypermodern, metamodern, you know, trans embodied, trans, you know, um, human, post-human type culture? I mean, that's part of what he may be diagnosing. And uh, I would, that's not the vision I want. I, you know, I, I think that there's a, there are other visions out there that are inclusive. The integral vision, the so-called integral vision, ideally, hypothetically, at least, should be inclusive of, of our embodiment in its most viscous, visceral, slimy, cheesy, <laughs> disgusting maybe forms, right? And, and if we can't be comfortable with that, I mean, Johnny, you're talking about the pelvis and the locks and so forth then we're always going to be taunted, you know, by um, what we've repressed and thrown in the trash. Uh, so th there's, th right. I think Rather it connects, yeah. I think it connects to, to, to a larger uh, visioning uh, and critical and realistic, realist type uh, project. Uh, and that may just be reading a whole lot into it <laughs> that mm -hmm. may or may not be there in, in the terms, at least, that I'm uh, articulating. So it doesn't look like Wendy's going to be back. Um, any last words? 
Glad I could make this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was really great to see you. <laughs> I don't know when it's going to happen again because of the schedule, yeah. but um, well, it's good to have, have the week. Good to have you. Have the week yeah. off for the holiday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Well. Yeah. I, we I, read I, you online, but it's nice to hear your voice as well. Um, yeah, and if we're going to read volumes two and three, um, we could reschedule it too. Like, I, I want to see who really wants to do it. I mean, part of you know, I'm I'm going to definitely go into globes after this. Mm. Believe it or not, <laughs> that's yeah, uh, I, I want to do the whole thing. Myself. I'm going to do it all. Too. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm very committed because I bought these fucking books. For years. John's got an investment going. <laughs> Same here, John. Same yeah, here. Like, yeah, it was a good yeah. deal, but you know now I have I haven't even taken volumes two or three out of the plastic yet. But mm-hmm. Globes is more my. I mean, I've said it on the on the forum too. The, the macro, social, yeah. macro, cultural, so politics. You know, yeah, feel yeah. So I'm, I'm very motivated. Thank you yeah. guys for helping me motivate myself to do this because mm-hmm. it's it's good good motivation to have a group. Excellent. We the reason to live another day. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> you have a positive effect. <laughs> <laughs> Happy trails. Bye bye. Okay, take care. Yeah. 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 All right. Bye now. <laughs>